Well, congregation, uh, we are not getting back to Mark just yet. Uh, perhaps we will uh, a little bit later once I've come back from holidays. Um, but for now, we are looking at the Gospel of John. We are looking at the Gospel of John, and particularly we are looking at John chapter 20, verses 19 through to 29. 19 to 29. And... Uh, this story is very familiar, uh, but we are going to look at it in uh, hopefully a way that provides us hope uh, in the midst of whatever we may be facing uh, and encouragement uh, for us as well. So this is what John chapter 19 verses uh, 24, or sorry, John chapter 20 verses 19 to 29 have to say to us. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them. Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and side. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Now Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, brothers and sisters, I always feel kind of bad for Thomas because he gets a bit of a bad rap from this one passage. And the truth is that we don't really hear a lot about Thomas throughout the rest of the Bible. Um, he's mentioned in the list of apostles once in Matthew or something. And he is, uh, or in Mark, I can't remember which, but he is also, uh, there is one other time that he is mentioned in the Gospel of John. But other than that, we don't really hear a lot about Thomas. In fact, there's a lot that we don't know about Thomas either from, from the church history or anything. Things that we can't nail down, that is. Um, we think we know some things, but it is more in the line of church tradition than it is in the line of nailed down historical fact that is provable. And so all we end up having is uh, a couple of instances in the Gospel of John and his name mentioned in the list of the apostles. And that's all we have to go on, really. And so Thomas, poor Thomas, ends up being called Doubting Thomas. Well, we need to outline a little bit more about him. And we also need to understand why his doubt is really actually significant for us. What it means for us. What is God saying to us about Thomas's doubt? So first of all, some, some more background about Thomas. So Thomas, um, or Didymus, 
Those names are both actually, they mean in different languages. So Didymus in Greek and Thomas is an anglicized version of a, he a Hebrew word. Um, but, but they actually mean twin. Um, and, and we think that his first name was Judas, right? So in one of the Gospels, he is mentioned as Judas, not Iscariot. So Thomas's name was probably actually Judas, but not Iscariot, not the betrayer of Jesus. And he was called twin. Now, we don't know exactly why he was called twin, but the church uh, the church's tradition has been that he was called twin, actually, because he looked a lot like Jesus. He looked very much like Jesus in physical appearance, right? And so um, it may have been one of those camaraderie things, one of those things, hey, you guys are twinsies, right? You guys look the same. Uh, now, we don't know that for sure. Um, it, it just the church's tradition and really in a way it doesn't matter uh too much but just when you when you read in the gospels about judas the other jews judas who's not the betrayer of jesus um then you're you got to remember thomas right um and uh just be aware that uh thomas was uh, a guy who may very well have looked a lot like Jesus did physically. Other than that, the there are there are three um, pretty old books that claim to have been written by Judas, but or by Thomas, Judas Thomas. Um, but the the church has uh, discerned them to be not actually written by Thomas. Uh, one is the Gospel of Thomas, one is the Acts of Thomas, and the other one is uh, the, the Life of Thomas, the Contender, or something like that. I can't remember what the third one is called. But none of those are included in our Bible because they were known to actually not be written by the actual Thomas. They were uh, pseudopigrapha, uh, which means is a fancy way of saying that someone wrote them under a false name. Uh, they claimed to be Thomas, but they weren't actually. And they were actually written much later than uh, Thomas was alive. Um, I think the earliest of those was written in, you know, 145 AD, which is, if you think about it, 145 years after the birth of Christ. And so probably not Thomas, right? Um, but these books do contain potentially some information about what happened to Thomas afterwards. And again, we don't know for sure, but we we think in church tradition that what happened, and, and this is uh, this is fairly well attested to, is that Thomas uh, Thomas after uh, after Jesus' death and resurrection, um, he uh, he stayed around Jerusalem for a little while, um, but then uh, he felt the call. Uh, to go out towards the east. And so we find that um, there was an empire to the east of Rome called Parthia. Um, that was, it was not a very long lived empire, but it was there. Um, and we believe that Thomas moved into there and did some evangelism there. And then we are pretty certain that uh, Thomas from there went to India and arrived there around the year 52. So this would have been, you know, almost 20 years after Jesus' death and resurrection. Um, Thomas ended up in India. And um, and as a result, India, uh, whether, you know, Western Christians know it or not, India has some of the oldest Christian communities uh, in the world, uh, to, together with the, uh, the Coptic Church in, uh, in North Africa, Ethiopia, and so on, um, and Egypt, uh, the Coptic Church and the um, 
in the Eastern Orthodox Church and the Roman Catholic Church also, of course. Um, but the, the Indian Church um, and the, the uh, Coptic Church of those are probably the oldest sort of uh, churches outside of Jerusalem that have that existed a uh, long time. And, and so to look at Thomas and to say, oh, there's doubting Thomas, is not to see the whole picture, is not to see the whole picture by any stretch of the imagination. Thomas went, as far as we know, as far as we can tell, Thomas went and established um, a, 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 a whole center of Christianity in a completely different part of the world. It just so happens that we don't have the written stuff um, like we do with, with say, Paul or, or Peter or James uh, as well, right? So remember that Thomas is not simply doubting Thomas. We need to remember also that the Bible itself, if you know, if we weren't sure what to do with uh, the church's tradition and how seriously to take it, the Bible itself in the Gospel of John, in John 11, testifies that Thomas is not simply a doubter either. When Jesus announces that he is going to go to Jerusalem and, and all the other disciples, all the other apostles are, are, are arguing with him and telling him that that's not safe, he shouldn't do that, the Pharisees are plotting against him, he is going to be in deep trouble, he might even be killed. Um, you know, all of the apostles are, are against it except for Thomas. Thomas says, Let's all go with him so that we may die with him. Now, admittedly, that's not necessarily a super positive view of things from the outside, at least. But, but he is not someone who is afraid. And he is not someone who lacks courage. And he is not someone who lacks conviction either. He is a deeply passionate and loyal person. Now, with the other disciples, he too fled away and deserted Jesus when push came to shove on the day of Good Friday. But that being said, Thomas alone among the disciples wanted to go with Jesus to Jerusalem without arguing with him so that he could stick by Jesus even to the end. So what do we do with Thomas's doubt then? If it wasn't about Thomas lacking courage, if it wasn't about Thomas lacking conviction, if it wasn't about Thomas lacking passion or um, anything like that, what what was it about? What does it mean? Well, one of the things it highlights for us, and one of the things that John, uh, through the inspiration of the Spirit, pulls out for us, is the reality that Jesus treats Thomas and his doubts with love. With love. Notice in the Gospel of John that we read in, ch in chapter uh, 20, uh, right near the beginning there, Jesus appears to the disciples in verse 19 and following. And G when Jesus appears to them, he shows them right away his hands and his side and his feet. Jesus shows them that right away. And so we can't be too critical when Thomas, a little bit later, says, unless I see those things, I won't believe. Now, Thomas does take it a step further and say that he's going to need to touch those things. But when push comes to shove there, too, he doesn't require that either. Right? So, in, in a way, Jesus patiently and lovingly gives Thomas exactly what he gave to the other apostles. He gives him the 
proof that they need. And who can blame them for needing that proof? If someone was to come back from the dead in our congregation, uh, I, I think probably I would need a lot of proof to convince me that that person was actually really truly back from the dead. Um, it's a little mind blowing to imagine that somebody is back from the dead or to, to have it proven to you. So let's not be too harsh on Thomas there either, right? On, on still another hand, it is interesting to see how Jesus addresses them, right? Jesus not only offers the same proof to both the disciples the first time and to Thomas and the rest of them the second time, and he goes further and says, hey, look, you know, um, you can touch me my hands, my side, uh, which also, by the way, indicates how Jesus, even if Jesus didn't, wasn't there present physically, when Thomas says those things, he still knows them, right? So t Jesus has that insight, that knowledge, because he is, once again, fully and completely God and fully and completely human. Anyways, Jesus knows about what Thomas has said, and he reveals his knowledge uh, about that when he offers that Thomas can touch there. But in addition, the, the thing that Jesus does is offers peace to them. Peace be with you, he says. In this little passage, three times, Twice on one occasion and once on another occasion, Jesus says, peace be with you. And this is so important for us. Because of the course, the reality is, is that we all have doubts sometimes. We all have doubts sometimes. Sometimes we doubt the existence of God at all. Sometimes we doubt the goodness of God. How can God be good and allow such terrible things to happen? Sometimes we doubt the wisdom of God. Oh God, if you really knew what I needed, you wouldn't be doing this to me. Right? Sometimes we, we doubt that God is actually with us. Sometimes we doubt God's goodness and righteousness and holiness. Sometimes we doubt God's omnipotence, his omnipresence, his all-powerfulness and his everywhere at once-ness. Some, sometimes we doubt that God could possibly love us. Maybe often we doubt that. Sometimes we doubt that God could possibly use us for good things in this world. Sometimes we doubt that God could, could give us the strength to share the gospel. We have our doubts too. And yet, what does Jesus say to us? Jesus says, peace. Be still. I know what you need, and I will give it to you. It reminds me very much of the prophet Elijah. Remember that story, right? Uh, Elijah is on the mountain. He has this battle with the prophets of Baal, right? And the fire comes down from heaven and consumes his altar, whereas they, they are totally unsuccessful in their uh, attempt to get Baal to light their altar, right? And then the people of Israel rally and they, they kill the prophets of Baal and they recommit themselves to the covenant of the Lord. But then right after that, Queen Jezebel says that she's going to get his head, that she is going to take Elijah's head. And Elijah is terrified and runs and runs and runs and runs. And he collapses finally in exhaustion. And God sends to him angels to minister to him. And in 
his doubt and in his struggle, the angels first, they provide him a meal. They provide him food and rest, food and sleep. And so he sleeps. And then they provide him food and sleep again. And only after God has said through that food and through that rest, in effect, peace be still, peace be with you. After that, God comes and talks to him and addresses his concerns and, and deals with them. And, and Elijah pours out how he is so afraid because he feels like he's alone. And God says to him, no, no, Elijah, you're not alone. In fact, you're going to appoint a new king. You're going to appoint another new king. And you are going to appoint apprentice to take over from you. And not only that, but there are still many people in Israel who have not bowed the knee to Baal. So see, this is the key thing about the story of Doubting Thomas, is that really, it's not actually about Thomas at all. Instead, it is about how God addresses all of our doubts. How God addressed Thomas's doubts. How God addressed the apostles' doubts, how God addresses, addresses Elijah's doubts, how God addresses my doubts and your doubts. And so, brothers and sisters, let us be encouraged today. For you may have doubts I don't know specifically what your doubts are about this week, but I'm pretty sure that you have them. And if not, you will, you will. But God says to Thomas, and God says to you, peace be with you. Peace be with you. And he gives us all we stand in need of to overcome those doubts and do his will. Let us pray. Father in heaven, thank you so very much for pouring out your son for us that he would redeem us, that he would conquer sin and death for us. And thank you so much, O oh God, that you did not just leave it hanging there, that we would wander around lost and forlorn, not knowing that you had conquered sin and death, but instead that you raised your son into new life and displayed him, showed him, allowed him to demonstrate his side and his hands and to wipe away the disciples' doubt. And thank you so much, O oh God, that you wiped away Thomas's doubt. And Lord, whether, whether he ended up in India or not, we thank you. We thank you for that. And we thank you, O oh God, that in a similar way, you wiped away Elijah's doubt. And in a similar way, O oh God, though it may not look the same to us, you also wipe away our doubts, oh God. Please help us to submit those doubts to you honestly and openly, oh God. And may we listen for your answer, for how you show us your way. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.